Hello, my name is Charles Merritt, and welcome to episode two of a three-episode series where we are journeying through those two classic, traditional, iconic Catholic prayers, the Hail Mary and the Our Father. In episode one, we journeyed through the Hail Mary, and we literally unpacked that prayer line by line and word by word to get a better understanding of and appreciation for exactly what we're praying in the hopes that when we pray it in the future, it will be able to enter into it more profoundly and more deeply than we ever have before. Same goal for the Our Father. Now, we're going to devote two episodes to the Our Father because it's a little bit longer prayer, but our goal is the same, to journey through it and unpack it line by line and oftentimes word by word, again, to get a better understanding of and appreciation for what we're praying when we pray the Our Father so we can enter into it more deeply and fully than we have in the past. So if you uh, missed episode one with the Hail Mary, um, you know, it'd be great if you can go back and watch that. Episodes two and three, we're going to be talking about the Our Father. Now, the Our Father is, and again, uh, in, in, in unpacking these prayers, I'm going to make a pretty good use of Scripture because Catholicism is eminently biblical, and its prayers are biblical. We saw that last episode with the Hail Mary. Uh, the first two lines of the Hail Mary come right out of the Gospel of Luke chapter 1. Likewise, the Our Father is biblical because we find the Our Father in two Gospels, the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew. So I'll be making use of Scripture, and to that end, if you see me kind of flipping through a few papers on my desk, just to make sure I've got the chapters and the verses and the verbiage right, I've jotted down a few things, so if you see me flipping through papers, fair warning, that's what I'm looking at, is I'm looking at the scripture passages I'll be referencing in both this episode and next episode. So with that, let's say a few introductory words about the Our Father, then we'll dive into it. Now, the Our Father is a prayer that we pray not only in our private devotion, but we pray it every time we, we participate in Mass, whether that Mass is a Sunday Mass, a Holy Day of Obligation Mass, or a weekday Mass, if we are participating in Holy Mass, we are praying the Our Father. So it's, it's a prayer that's not only part of our private devotion, it's also a prayer of the Church's public liturgy. And if you recall the last time you participated in Mass, the priest will say one line leading into the praying of the Our Father. Now, sometimes this varies, but the official line the priest is supposed to say, leading us into the pray praying of the Our Father, is, at the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, and then we all pray the Our Father. And if you look at that phrase, we can break it into three interesting parts. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say. And through the course of this and next episode, we'll be diving into each of those three parts of what the priest says, because they are very true. We're praying the Our Father at the Savior's command. We're doing it informed by divine teaching, and believe it or not, the Our Father is a very daring prayer to say, daring for two reasons. So if that doesn't pique your uh, interest and whet your appetite, well, here goes, okay? Now, let's set the scene, okay? The Our Father, we said, is biblical. We find it in the Gospel of Luke and in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, in the Gospel of Luke, now, now Luke, uh, again, we, we see Jesus praying at various times in all the Gospels. But specifically, the Gospel of Luke really gives us a good insight into the prayer life of Jesus. In fact, there's one occasion where the disciples, in seeing Jesus pray, they ask him, Lord, teach us how to pray like John taught his disciples. Now, John is the John the Baptist. But again, when you're looking at Scripture, words are so significant. Words have meaning. Listen to what the disciples asked Jesus. Again, get the picture. They're watching Jesus pray, and they say, Lord, teach us how to pray. They didn't say, teach us what to pray. They said, teach us how to pray. That one word, how rather than what, gives us our first hint about two aspects of the Our Father. 
not only is it a prayer that we, we pray like any other prayer, it's a kind of a formula prayer. The Our Father, in praying it, yes, we're praising God the Father. Yes, we're petitioning Him for certain things. So it is a, a prayer of praise and petition. But beyond that, it's kind of a pattern for how to pray, literally, which is what uh, uh, Jesus said. It's a formula type prayer. So it gives us kind of the protocol or the pattern of how to approach prayer in general, okay? So again, get the picture. Jesus, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is praying. The disciples are watching him, and they say, Lord, teach us how to pray. Now, how does Jesus respond to that? Jesus says, when you pray, pray this. And that's where he rolls out the Our Father. So the Our Father is biblical because one of the two areas in Scripture comes from is right here in the Gospel of Luke. Now, let's take a closer look at Jesus' response. The disciples say, teach us how to pray. Jesus responds, when you pray, pray this. And again, words have meaning. Jesus says, when you pray, not if you pray, when you pray, okay? So prayer is, prayer is something Jesus expects us to do. It's not just a, um, a recommendation or a suggestion or it would be nice if we did it. A Jesus expects us to pray, okay? That's why going back to the, uh, the, the, the first, uh, that, that phrase the priest says before he introduces the Our Father, at the Savior's command, we see it right here. Not if you pray, when you pray. The expectation is that we're going to pray to Jesus. Why? Because at the end of the day, he wants a relationship with us. And like in any earthly relationship, in a relationship, you've got to have conversation, okay? And that's what, and if Jesus wants us to have a relationship with him, which he does, then the expectation is, is that we converse with him. And we do that in and through our prayer. So in the Gospel of Luke, in, in giving us the biblical basis for the Our Father, uh, the disciples question and Jesus' response, or the disciples, uh, um, well, yeah, their question and Jesus' response is really instructive. Lord, teach us how to pray, which indicates the Our Father is not just a regular prayer, it's kind of a pattern or a formula prayer. And Jesus' response, when you pray, the expectation is that we pray to Jesus. So that's where we find the Our Father in the Gospel of Luke. Now, we find it again in the Gospel of Matthew, okay? Little different slant, okay? In Matthew, it comes up in Matthew chapter 6. And the reason I mention that is Matthew chapters 5 through 7 is the famous uh, Sermon on the Mount. So the Our Father being introduced in Matthew 6 puts it smack dab in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And we know how important and how significant the Sermon on the Mount is. So the context of Matthew's uh, recording of uh, uh, Jesus giving the Lord's Prayer, the context of it is the great Sermon on the Mount. That's a tip off of how important this particular prayer is, okay? Now again, okay, the disciples, uh, ask Jesus, how do we pray? And, and here, Jesus, before he gives them the Our Father, says again, you know, when you pray. So again, we get the expectation, not a suggestion, not a recommendation. The expectation is that we pray to Jesus. So when the disciples ask Jesus how to pray in, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus again says, when you pray, and then he gives two ways not to pray, okay? He says, don't be like the hypocrites and stand and pray in the synagogues and on street corners so other people can see you. And then he says, don't be like the pagans who babble on with long prayers, thinking that they'll impress God with words. So in Matthew, in Luke, the disciples say, how do we pray? Jesus says, when you pray, straight out gives them the Our Father. 
in Matthew, the disciples ask, you know, uh, how do we pray? And Jesus, before he gives them the Our Father in Matthew, okay, tells them two ways not to pray. And then with those two ways not to pray, he then launches into how to pray, and he gives them the Our Father. So first question is, uh, is the Our Father biblical? A resounding yes. We find it given in the Gospel of Luke and in the Gospel of Matthew. And in both cases, since Jesus says when you pray, not if, we are praying it at the Savior's command, which is the first part of that phrase the priest uses before he introduces the Our Father in Mass. Okay, now let's go to the second part of that phrase, informed by divine teaching. Okay, what have we just talked about the last 10 minutes or so? Scripture, the Word of God. So we are informed, all right, not only how to pray the Our Father, but the words we use were informed by divine teaching. We're informed by the Word of God, specifically as it's recorded in the Gospel of Luke and in the Gospel of Matthew. So when the priest says, at the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, the, the, the priest is saying something that's very true, okay? The expectation is we do pray the Our Father, and we get the words uh, from Scripture. So it is at the Savior's command, and it is informed by divine teaching. Now let's get to that third part of the phrase, okay? We dare to say, and, and if you're thinking, wait a second, you know, I've been praying the Our Father like the Hail Mary. I've been praying on my entire life since I was a little kid. Um, what's so daring about praying the Our Father? Well, there's got to be something daring about it. Otherwise, the rubrics of the Mass wouldn't tell the priest to say that, okay? So if the priest says, we dare to say, or we have the courage to say, uh, it's got to be daring in some way, shape, or form, and therefore we've got to have some courage in order to pray it. Well, in what way is it daring? Well, it's daring in two ways, okay? The first way, we have to go all the way back to the Old Testament, okay? Because the Israelites, okay, now they, they, you know, they referred to, they, their relationship with God, okay, was Father, but they viewed him as the Father of the entire nation of Israel. They viewed him as the Father of all the Israelites, collectively, corporately. They didn't necessarily view him as each person's individual father, they viewed him as the father of the Israelites collectively and corporately. So the fact that God was father, okay, that wasn't foreign to the Israelites, okay, but their view of him was a, 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 as a collective or a corporate father, a father to all the Israelites collectively and corporately, okay? Now, when we pray the Our Father, we're, playing, we're praying it collectively and corporately, okay, uh, in Mass, all right, but we're also praying it individually in our private devotional prayer, okay? So, what would have been daring for the Israelites back then is to call God your own particular Father, that would have been very daring to them because they didn't view God uh, as a kind of a private father. They viewed him as a collective and a corporate father. So, so when Jesus told his disciples, okay, to pray the Our Father, okay, the view coming, coming into that was Father collectively and corporately. Now Jesus is saying, yes, He's the father of all of us, of all of God's people collectively and corporately, but he's also each individual person's father, okay? And to kind of roll it out in that fashion would have been very daring for those disciples to say, because at that point in time, that's not how you viewed God the Father, okay? So that's one of the reasons why that uh, the priest says, we dare to say. The other reason praying the Our Father is daring 
is going to come up later on in one of the petitions we say. Because as we get into the Our Father, as we will in the balance of this episode and next episode, as we get into those petitions, one of the petitions, and you know it well, we pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, okay? And if you take a look at that line, and I don't want to steal too much of my thunder too quickly, because we'll unpack this a little bit later on, but in the middle of that petition is that two-letter word, as. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So what we're asking God the Father to do is, yes, forgive us our trespasses, to the degree that we forgive others, okay? And that's, very, that's, that's a bold uh, statement. That's a bold petition. That's very daring to say. You're saying, God the Father, forgive me to the same degree I forgive others, which causes one to say, okay, to what degree am I currently forgiving others because it's to that degree that I'm asking God to forgive me. So to say those words, especially that two-letter word, as, very daring. So, let's go back to that phrase. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, and then we launch into the Our Father. Okay, so if the priest uses that phrase, the next time you participate in Mass, the three parts of that phrase are very, very true. We're saying it at Savior's command. We're getting the prayer itself through divine teaching, the Word of God. And for those two reasons, it is a daring prayer to say. Okay? So with that kind of backdrop, now let's get into the actual lines of the Our Father itself. Let's unpack them one by one, stopping at particular words to kind of, because there's particular words that are going to kind of be act as keys to unlock each verse, okay? So, daring as it is, let's dive in, okay? Our Father who art in heaven, okay? Let's stop there, okay? Our Father, again, collectively and corporately, and now as of the giving of this prayer in Luke and Matthew, individually, okay? So the hour, again, keep in mind, even, even though we're, we're, we're all praying it collectively at Mass, we're each praying it individually. So the hour has a collective aspect to it, and it has a personal individual aspect to it. And we're calling God Father, okay? Not only collectively, but also individually. And when we call God Father, we're not only... Uh, uh, calling him what he is, but who he is, okay? Because it, God is not like a father. God is a father. He is our father, as we're saying. And that makes us, us, uh, that makes us his adopted children. When do we become his adopted children? When we're baptized. When we're baptized, one of the many things that happen is we are adopted into God's family. We're adopted into God's family as his children, which makes him not like a father, but a father. So when we say our father, the our part, as we've mentioned, is collective and personal. And by calling him father, we're not, we're not saying he's like a father. He is a father. In fact, we can go even further and we can say all human fatherhood is a participation in his divine fatherhood, okay? So right off the bat, we're only two words into the first line of a kind of a lengthy prayer, and look at all of the stuff that's behind it. That's why we're going to need two episodes to unpack this one, okay? So our Father, and then we conclude, who art in heaven. And here we want to be mindful of two things. When we say who art in heaven, we're indicating uh, where God is, his home, heaven. And we're also indicating that ultimately that's our home. 
okay? Earth is not our home. We're pilgrims here. We're on a pilgrim journey. Heaven is our true and ultimate home. That's where our Father is. And where our Father is, that's where we strive to be. So when we say, our Father who art in heaven, we're indicating, yes, he's in heaven, but we're also indicating that that is our ultimate and true home, and that is our goal, to be where he is in heaven. So that's our first line, okay? Then we come to the second line, hallowed be thy name. Hallow, hallowed uh, uh, meaning holy, okay? So we're saying kind of holy be thy name, okay? Now, the two aspects we want to consider in this line is something that we don't mean and something that we do mean, okay? Now, what we're not saying, what we don't mean is we are making God's name holy, okay? God, we're not making God's name holy or God holy for that matter. He is holy in and of himself, okay? Uh, so what we're saying is that we want God's name to be considered holy, okay? We, we don't make it holy. It already is holy. He's holy. We don't make God holy. He is already holy in and of himself, okay? We want him and his name to be thought of, to be considered, to be spoken of as holy, okay? And what that does is it causes us to say, okay, okay, if, if our goal is that God and his name be considered holy, okay, how are we or not we contributing to that? Through my, my speech, through my actions, through my lifestyle, through my prayer life, through how I speak of him, okay? Am I, or, uh, am I, you know, am I, participating in the fact that he is holy and his name is holy, okay? Or am I taking away from that, okay? So when we say, hallowed be thy name, okay, what we're saying is that we want God's name to be holy, okay? We want God to be considered holy by those around us. So how do we contribute or not to that okay so let's take a pause for a second let's kind of collect our thoughts okay what have we learned so far we've learned that the lord's prayer is biblical it's recorded in two of the four gospels luke and matthew okay in each case jesus gives the our father in response to the disciples asking how to pray okay and Jesus responds to their question by saying, when you pray, okay? So it's the expectation is that we pray this prayer. Then he gives us the prayer in Luke and in Matthew. So we're informed about the words of that prayer by divine teaching, by scripture. And for those two reasons we talked about, how at the point he gave it to the disciples, God the Father was looked at as a collective father and not an individual father. To pray this prayer would have been daring to them at that time. And those, that petition where we're asking God to forgive us to the degree we forgive others, for those two reasons, saying the Our Father is daring. Okay, So that's what we've talked about so far in the intro. Then we got into the first two lines, our collective and personal, father, he's not just like a father, he is a father, we are his adopted sons and daughters, who art in heaven, he's in heaven, and our ultimate home is to be with him in heaven, okay, that's our goal, hallowed be thy name, we want his name and him to be considered holy, and that brings up the question of, am I contributing to that or not to those around me? So, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Next line is, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay? 
So in this line, we're really asking two things in one line. Thy kingdom come is one, thy will be done is a second. And we're asking that his kingdom come and his will be done in a certain way, on earth as it is in heaven. All right? Now, in heaven, both of those are done perfectly and completely. Okay? So when we say this line, thy king, if, if we kind of break it up into two parts, we kind of reformat it a bit. If we say, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're asking both those things to be done on earth as, as perfectly and completely as they are in heaven. Okay? Now, human beings with fallen human nature, okay, that, that's not going to happen. But the goal is to try and achieve that as closely as possible. Which again brings up a question we have to ponder. You know, this is why the Our Father is so daring, because not only was it daring to look at uh, the Father uh, individually uh, at this point in time when he gave it to the disciples, and not only is it daring because we're asking God to forgive us as we forgive others, each line of it is kind of daring because it, it should give us pause to consider okay. Where am I currently with this line, okay? Am I currently, okay, living a life, okay, uh, and, and speaking about God in a way that manifests him and his name as holy, okay? Uh, thy kingdom come, okay, on earth as it is in heaven. What am I doing to build the kingdom of God? Am I doing anything? Or am I doing stuff that's actually tearing down the kingdom of God? Okay? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How, how, how well am I doing God's will? How well am I surrendering to his will in my life? Or am I? Is it my will, not his will? So again, we're, we're barely getting into the Our Father and we can get a sense of how powerful this prayer is, okay? Because if you really think of it in kind of the vein that we're approaching it, uh, it, 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 it should put the burden on us to kind of reflect on our lives, okay, uh, speech and action, and ask ourselves, how are we doing in regards to the lines of this prayer, okay? Uh, that's why, you know, I've always considered the Our Father, okay, kind of a good examination of conscience, uh, especially this part, okay? Am I building the kingdom of God? Am I doing His will? Am I manifesting Him and His name as holy, okay? Those are very daring questions to ask. And, you know, the possibility might be that, you know, we might not like the answer. But if we don't like the answer, that's good because that gives us a kind of a good self-check and we can kind of make some course corrections uh, on our journey ultimately to our true home, which hopefully is heaven. So our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay. And uh, another thing we should mention, okay, when we say thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, okay, um, you good Catholic scripture scholars out there, some, some bells should be ringing because I'm recalling an incident on Holy Thursday night uh, on the Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus is going through his agony in the garden. And you know it well, you know where I'm going with this. He's, he's flat on his face and he's praying to, to, to his father, you know, if it be possible, take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. So when, I, when we pray, thy will be done, it, it, in a certain sense, we're echoing the words of Jesus as he went through his agony in the garden on the eve of his passion and death. Powerful, powerful, okay? And that's why we're taking up, uh, that's why we're doing this series where we're journeying through these prayers. Because as I mentioned in episode one, 
you know, they're so familiar to us because we've been praying them all our lives and we have them memorized, you know, our familiarity with them sometimes works against us because we say them without really contemplating or meditating or maybe even understanding and appreciating what they mean, okay? So hopefully this series will kind of break through our familiarity with them so that we can really say, you know something? Yeah, these prayers are familiar to us. Yes, we've memorized them, but they're so much more than we ever thought they were, okay? That's why we're doing this series. So hopefully, episode one, you got that idea with the Hail Mary, and so far in episode two here, you're getting the same idea with the Our Father, where we're kind of pulling back the curtain, so to speak, and we're looking at the richness and the deepness and the beauty of these two prayers that we're so familiar with. Because, it, you know, we don't want, whether it's a scripture passage, whether it's a prayer, whether it's Mass itself, we never want our familiarity to cause us not to understand and appreciate our Catholic faith. So, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, that's kind of the first part. Now, from here on out, that's where the petitions start. Okay, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. Okay, lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Those are what we're asking God the Father for. Those are the petition part of the Our Father. Okay, before we get into the individual lines and the individual petitions, again, words are significant. They have meaning not only in Scripture but in prayer. Okay give us, okay, forgive us, lead us not, deliver us. For you English majors out there, those are all verbs. Those are all action-oriented words. And, and, and look at the, um, the relationship in which we're asking. Now, again, get the picture. We're in prayer, okay, or we're in Mass, and we're praying to God the Father, our Father, okay, collectively and individually. And we're saying, we're asking Him for things, okay? Give us our daily bread, okay? We don't take it. He gives it to us, okay? Del uh, forgive us, okay? We need His forgiveness, Deliver us from evil, okay? We need his grace against Satan, okay? Lead us not into temptation. We need his grace not to fall into temptation and sin. So when we say those petitions, before we get into the individual petitions themselves, the way that they're structured, the relationship we have when we say them, okay, is basically what we're saying when we say any of those petitions and all of them collectively, in essence, we're saying, God, we can't do this on our own. We need your help. We need your grace, okay? So when we get into the petition part of the Our Father, okay, before we enter into the individual petitions, that's really what this part of the prayer is about. It's, it's, it's to, to give us, uh, you know, to kind of uh, remind ourselves, as well as to give voice to the fact that we can't do it on ourselves, but by ourselves, we need God's help, we need God's grace. We can't save ourselves, we need a Savior. In other words, we're giving voice to our ultimate dependence on God. Okay, and, you know, in this day and age, dependence on God is not a real popular thing. It's, you know, uh, you know, I can do it myself. I don't need any help. I, do, I certainly don't need God's help. I'm perfectly capable uh, myself. Here we're saying, no, that's not the case, okay? Uh, we're, we're saying, God, God the Father, my Father, I need your help. I can't do it on my own. I can't save myself. I need you. So it really speaks, all of those petitions, individually and collectively, 
really speak to our dependence on our Heavenly Father. So let's take a look now uh, at each of the petitions in general, okay? Now again, let's backtrack a little bit to kind of keep in mind where we are in the prayer as we enter into the petition part of that prayer, okay? We have called God our Father, collectively and individually. He is not just like a father. He is a father. He is our father because we are his adopted sons and daughters by virtue of our baptism. He is in heaven. And where God is, we ultimately want to be. So heaven is our true home, not on earth. Okay. So that's the first line. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We want his name to be rec- we want him and his name to be recognized as being holy. So am I contributing to that or am I taking away from that? Thy kingdom come as it is, uh, 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 as it is in heaven on earth, okay? Uh, what am I doing to build the kingdom of God? Am I uh, building it up or am I tearing it down? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. To what degree am I surrendering myself to God's will? Okay. And then getting into the petition part. So before we even ask God for those petitions, for that individual help, okay, we've said a lot about him and we've said a lot to him already. All right. So, like we said, powerful prayers. All right. So let's get into those petitions. Okay. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, you good Catholic scripture scholars out there, this should ring another bell, okay? Because the first thing that should come into your mind, okay, is daily bread. You're asking God the Father from heaven to give you each day your daily bread. Now, if I'm going back through my Catholic memory... I'm landing in the Old Testament, I'm landing in the book of Exodus, and I'm landing in the point where the Israelites have been delivered out of Egypt, they've gone through the Red Sea, and now they're traversing the desert on their way to the Promised Land, right? And of course, it's a desert. They had to leave Egypt in haste, all right? So they didn't pack a whole lot of food, right? So they're in the desert, and they're complaining to Moses, look, we've got no food, okay? So God rains down from heaven food, manna, right? And the deal was that every overnight, every day, he would send down enough manna for that particular day, okay? The only exception was the day before the Sabbath when he would give them two days worth of bread because the Sabbath they had to rest. But every other day, God gave them food from heaven, but he only gave them each day food for that day. Okay? So when we say give us our, give us this day our daily bread, we're kind of echoing that particular episode, that particular event, uh, as it's recorded in the book of Exodus in the Old Testament, okay? Now, let's dive a little bit deeper. Give us this day our daily bread. And you might say, well, you know, you know, if I'm an English major, for those English majors out there, you'd say, well, isn't that a little redundant? This day our daily bread, uh, that sounds kind of redundant to me. Doesn't that break some rule of grammar, okay? Well, I don't know, grammatically, I suppose, I'm not an English major, but grammatically, I suppose it could be redundant. But, but the, the point is, again, is one, remember we said each of these petitions speak to our, collectively and individually, speak to our dependence on God, okay? So where in this particular de- uh, petition does it speak to our dependence on God? It speaks to our dependence on God in a couple of areas. Give us. Not we take, we're relying on God to give us our daily bread, right? And we're depending on God uh, each and every day for that daily bread. 
So here it speaks to an overall dependence on God as well as a continual daily, day in and day out dependence on God. Okay. Now in this particular prayer, the daily bread that we're praying for obviously is not an Old Testament manna, it's the Eucharist. Okay. Um, and that's one of the reasons why going back to the fact that we pray this prayer, right, every time we participate in Holy Mass, let's think of where the church places the prayer in Mass. Now again, the church could have placed this prayer anywhere in Mass, right? Where does it place it? When we pray the Our Father, if you think through the last Mass you attended, or when you go to your next Mass, if you kind of make a mental note to yourself to kind of uh, uh, pay attention to this, the Our Father comes after the words of consecration, after the bread and wine become the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. You know, uh, uh, we now have the Eucharist, right, on our altar. And we're saying a prayer after that happens, right? And before we actually receive the Eucharist and Holy Communion. So when we say, give us this day our daily bread, we're referring to the Eucharist. And in the Mass, in just a couple of minutes, God will be doing just that. He will be giving us the Eucharist, okay? And literally, if you go to Mass every day, you're getting this daily bread, this heavenly bread, the Eucharist, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. You are literally getting it every single day. And that's another thing about the beauty of the Catholic faith. You know, at a certain point, not only does, I mean, not only is it eminently reasonable and logical and, and make total sense, but at, at, at some point, everything starts to kind of, you know, kind of uh, congeal together. Everything starts to connect uh, together. And so when we say, give us this day our daily bread, uh, we're asking God to do just that, okay? To give us the heavenly bread, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus in the Eucharist. And if we're praying it at Mass in a few minutes, literally, that is what's going to happen. So that's why the church puts the Our Father where it does in the, in, in, the, uh, in the Mass, because once we pray it, in a few short minutes, we'll actually be living out that actual petition, okay? So give us this day our daily bread, the give, the this day, the daily, speaks to, as all the petitions do, speak to our dependence on God, our need for God, and a dependence and a need not just once in a while, not just every decade, each and every day of our lives. Because, you know, the enemy, Satan, yeah, he's the devil, but he's an angel. He's a fallen angel. And angels, as we say, angels are pure spirits. They have no bodies. So the fact they have no bodies, they have no need to eat, they have no need to sleep. They are working on us 24-7, 365. They're working on us. Satan and, and, and his demons are working on us every single day. So it makes perfect sense to ask for God's help every single day, okay? And what greater help can we get than his body, blood, soul, and divinity coming into our very uh, our bodies? What better help can we get than his real presence in the Eucharist, okay? So a very powerful line and a very powerful petition. And again, it folds into our overall dependence on God, okay? So give us this day our daily bread, okay? Now here comes the big one, okay? And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, all right? So forgive us our trespasses. What are we saying when we say that part of this verse or this petition? Well, number one, we're recognizing and acknowledging and giving voice to the fact 
that we engage in trespasses, that we engage in sins, that we are sinners. So that's the first thing we're acknowledging, okay, is that we are sinners. And we're asking God to forgive us of those sins. So not only are we recognizing and acknowledging the fact we're sinners, we're also recognizing and acknowledging that by virtue of that fact, we need a Savior. The fact that we're sinners, we can't save ourselves. We need a Savior, and, 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 and we have one in Jesus. So when we say, forgive us our trespasses, we're really recognizing, acknowledging, and giving voice to two important things. A, that we're sinners, and B, as such, we need a Savior. Forgive us our trespasses, and now here comes the daring part of that petition, okay? As we forgive those who trespass against us. I mean, words have meaning, words are significant, even the tiniest of words. This two-letter word, which, you know, for if, if again, here's where our familiarity oftentimes works against us. We, 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 we know the prayer so well, we've got the words memorized. So when we get to this line, when we get to this petition, right, we just roll through it and we never stop to consider exactly what we're asking for, okay? And how daring and how courageous that is. Like I mentioned earlier, we're, yes, we're asking God to forgive us but we're asking him to forgive us to the degree that we forgive others, right? So I'll tell you, if you want uh, a nice examination of conscience, you know, each day before you go to bed, <laughs> this petition is, is a great one, all right? Because you've got to say, okay, all right? You know, uh, in, in human parlance, uh, the phrase is, be careful what you ask for, you just may get it. Well, this is kind of an example of that, okay? We're asking God to forgive us as we forgive others, right? So that begs the question, okay, Charles, uh, I'll use myself as an example. How, how am I doing in forgiving others, all right? If I'm not doing so well, okay, then I'm asking God, okay, you know, if, I'll, if I'm, just to put it in mathematics, just to give an example, if I'm only forgiving others, 10% of the time for the wrongs they've committed against me, then essentially what I'm saying is, God, since I'm only forgiving 10% of the time, I want you to forgive only 10% of my sins, or I want you to forgive me 10% of the time. Well, we don't want that, right? <laughs> we, we want God to, to forgive us all the time, right? But look at what we're asking. God, forgive us as we forgive others, okay? Um, and this is kind of interesting because another side to this, you know, tying this prayer back into scripture because Catholicism is biblical. These two prayers are biblical. Uh, in the Bible, okay, uh, Jesus says, you know, before you approach the altar, if you have anything against your brother, settle with him and then approach the altar, all right? So we're saying this prayer which has this petition in it at a point in the Holy Mass where we're about to approach the altar and receive the author of that forgiveness, Jesus himself. Okay, so again, the church knows what she's doing when she puts this prayer with its petitions at the point it is during the Holy Mass. Okay? So, let's really catch our breaths. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others who trespass against us. My bet is that when we say that line, the next time we say that line, either in our personal prayer time or during Mass, that two-letter word, as, that might have gotten lost in the petition that we might not have even thought about or even seen before. All of a sudden, that as, you know, if you're looking at it on paper, all of a sudden is magnified, right? It's huge, it's disproportionate 
to the rest of the line, right? And it's in bold, okay? I mean, that, that, that word as, wh when you say it, should come out in bold relief, okay? And it should cause us to say, okay, okay? You know, how am I doing in forgiving others? Because how I'm doing is to the degree that I'm asking God for forgiveness, okay? And again, thank God that, we, that, that, that he's a forgiving God. Okay, because again, we're sinners. And the fact, and that's another thing kind of our, 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 our mind should kind of land on and ponder as we say this line. And that is that the fact that God is even willing to forgive us as sinners time and time again. That's something that as Catholics, you know, we maybe take for granted. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. God forgives me. God has to forgive me. Well, you know. God chooses. You know, God doesn't have to do anything. God has a, 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 a free will just like we do. Granted, he has a divine free will. We have a human free will. So God chooses to forgive us. So the fact that we can even, when we say that line, in, uh, in addition to how daring it is and how it should cause us to ponder our level of forgiveness to others, it should also kind of bring us back to the fact of, yeah, how great of a God is it that he is willing and chooses to forgive us in the first place? The fact that we even pray this line, we're praying it to a forgiving God. And sometimes I, we don't even think about that. Sometimes we kind of take it for granted. Again, we don't want to let our familiarity work against us. So at this point, it's probably a good stopping point. We'll stop this episode. And then in episode three, we'll pick up, we'll start with a little review, then we'll pick up where we left off here and finish going through the final couple of verses and couple of petitions of the Our Father. So hopefully, with the Hail Mary in episode one and the first half of the Our Father in this episode, hopefully you're coming away from these uh, podcasts saying, yeah, you know something? There's a lot more to these prayers than I thought they, there was. And yes, I'm gaining a better understanding. And through my better understanding, I'm gaining a better appreciation for them, which will enable me to enter into them in a more profound, a more deep manner. That's the hope in this three-part series. So until uh, part three, take care, everybody.